Welcome to A Time for Change. I'm Sibyl Marcellus here with Kristen Myers and Alexis Christophorus. We're just days away from an important holiday that gets even bigger each year, Juneteenth. It's the commemoration of June 19th, 1865, a day when some were still enslaved in this country and were finally set free. Juneteenth is a day of celebration, but with its own complicated history. Here's a quick look at the roots of the holiday. The full story of Juneteenth begins with President Abraham Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation, which went into effect on January 1st, 1863, stating that all persons held as slaves shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. But two years later, there were still more than 250,000 enslaved people in Texas. Finally, on June 19, 1865, just after the end of the Civil War, U.S. General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas, to release them from slavery, declaring that all slaves are free. Today, June 19th, or Juneteenth, is celebrated as the effective end of slavery, recognized as a holiday by the majority of U.S. states, and since the murder of George Floyd, honored by more and more companies. Now, this year in Galveston, on the very spot where General Granger stood, a new 5,000 square foot mural commemorates the long and difficult journey from enslavement to freedom. It pulls its name, Absolute Equality, from Granger's words that day in 1865, when he called for an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves. And joining us now to talk about Juneteenth and racial justice is Aisha Bell Hardaway, assistant professor of law at Case Western Reserve University. Professor, great to have you here with us. Uh, so Juneteenth is known as Jubilee Day, but it's also known as Freedom Day. How are you reflecting on a day that is about freedom, especially after a year like 2020 and when, thanks to the criminal justice system, so many Black Americans, particularly Black men, are not free? Yeah, so thank you so much for having me, Kristen and Alexis. It's great to be uh, with you today. I, um, as we always have um, um, in recent in recent time, you know, since I've been an adult, me and my family, we commemorate uh, Juneteenth together uh, as a celebration. And it is, Kristen, as you say, something that uh, marks freedom uh, is something worth celebration, uh, celebrating. Uh, emancipation is something worth celebrating, uh, especially considering all of the horrors, um, the degradation, the subjugation, right? Um, that that is that we know now know is American slavery. Um, that is something that requires jubilation and celebration. But as as you mentioned, right, the symbolism of Juneteenth in a lot of ways has only um, really uh, been that for many still yet in this country, many Black people still yet in this country because of the realities of what happened after emancipation during Reconstruction and how the 13th Amendment uh, really became a vehicle by which we were able to use the carceral state as a new entity by which we would have slavery by another name. Uh, and, and so that reality right now, we know America is the leader um, in terms of prison population population rates um, uh, of, of any country uh, in, in, in the world. Um, and, and having those types of numbers uh, uh, with 60% of black and brown people uh, being the, uh, comprising those who are housed in prison jails and detention centers, right? We know that freedom, as you mentioned, is something that does not exist for many um, black Americans in this country. Professor, we know that Juneteenth is not a federal holiday. Uh, all but three states recognize it as a state or ceremonial holiday, the exceptions being North and South Dakota and Hawaii. What would it mean to the nation if Juneteenth were to become a, a federal holiday? That's a really great question. I mean, what does it mean to the citizens of the states where it, it, it's recognized as, as a state holiday? I think we... Uh, should be very careful about letting the symbolism of the day uh, become more than what the principle behind 
emancipation is supposed to be. Um, and so while uh, looking at that map there, right? So while recognizing that so many states do observe the Juneteenth holiday, the real question is what does that look like um, in, um, in practice on, for the lives of black Americans who we know are subjected to racial disparities, not just in the criminal legal system, but also in housing in education in employment in health healthcare, in so many areas uh, of everyday life across the board, uh, right? Uh, Black Americans experience a level of dim uh, discrimination and racial disparity bias um, uh, that, that, that undermines or undercuts what we would imagine, what I think the principles of emancipation or freedom are supposed to stand for. Um, so, <clears throat> so I think, you know, recognizing the, the, the day or commemorating the day uh, as a holiday is important, but I don't believe that that is the only thing that needs to happen here. We need to be careful to not rest on our laurels and allow marking holidays uh, to become a substitute for the work that needs to take place. So, Professor, some of the work that needs to take place that a lot of folks have been chatting about lately, uh, two big issues in particular. One is reparations, and the second is criminal justice reform, particularly with an eye on police reform. We have seen a lot of movements, um, both on federal, national levels, but also on state and local levels, not just to reform the police, but also for moves towards reparations. I'm curious to know, as we're in this moment of solution finding right now, if the best strategy moving forward is to do something on a federal, national level, is that where the push needs to be made for something like reparations? Or is it uh, best to do this on a local level? Are we actually going to make progress only when states and local mun municipalities take up that mantle? Yeah, can I say both? I think the reality <laughs> is, is that um, there's a lot of work to be done here. And uh, waiting for the state or waiting for the federal government uh, to step in uh, and to accept responsibility for what, wherever that, uh, whatever that looks like, or wherever that may lie, for their um, their obligations or or, or their misconduct uh, um, is important. Let me just say that really. Let, let me say that really clearly. I'm sorry, I'm stumbling here. I think if the federal government uh, can move on House Bill. 40 that has been introduced into Congress uh, every year since John Conyers introduced, began introducing it um, in the 1990s. I, right, I think that is could be critically important um, and is critically important. But I think the leadership that like the state of California or the city of Evanston, Illinois has demonstrated is also critically important because we know that the federal administrations change uh, from time to time. As we saw, you mentioned police reform under the prior administration, there really was no appetite for police reform. And, and, and because of that, states like Illinois had to assume a role uh, in ensuring that consent decrees or police reform came to cities like Chicago. Um, and so I think that to be short in my answer, a little bit short than it was, uh, both. We need to have the ability on both the state and the federal front um, to enact um, um, remedies such as whether it's consent decrees or reparations. Mm -hmm. On the issue of reparations, Professor, most Americans, in fact, 67 percent, say the government should not make cash payments to the descendants of slaves, and it falls along racial lines. 73 percent of black Americans believe reparations should be made. Just 16 percent of whites feel that way. There, there are some individuals who become defensive. They argue, I didn't enslave anyone personally. Why should I have to pay? What would you say to those people? I would say that um, a question of personal responsibility has never been the answer for addressing governmental harm. Um, um, that individuals who may or may not have lived during a particular time um, 
don't necessarily, that, that doesn't carry the weight and it doesn't get to the crux of the problem. Uh, the real issue with American slavery is the fact that it was uh, sanctioned by the government, um, that the, 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 the land that we live on was, was worked on uh, by Blacks um, and, 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 and that the, the benefit of that uh, labor has gone to the government and to corporations and in fact has built white wealth in this country. But the individual responsibility for that is not the, um, the answer or, or uh, the distinction by which we should decide whether or not reparations are do. The real question is whether or not the harm or, um, or the debt is owed. And I think that there's extensive research. I know that there's extensive research that answers that question in the affirmative, right? The next question should be, how does the government and how do certain corporations that benefited it, uh, from um, those that were enslaved and not compensated for, for that labor, how, does, how do those entities make good on the benefit that they unjustly received. All right, Aisha Bell Hardaway, Assistant Law Professor at Case Western Reserve University. Thanks so much for joining us today.